Happy New Year, online family. Uh, we are not having a live service online today. We are meeting in person, yet we still wanted to reach out and share some uh, moments of worship with you in a message. We're actually having a best of service. This is where we're going to look back at 2023 and share some of our best of worship moments, as well as one of the more significant and talked about messages uh, from 2023. It's not by me, in fact. It's actually uh, shared a message by Ryan Del Blanc, uh, who preaches from time to time here at Horizon. Uh, and I really believe and I'm confident that uh, as you listen to this message and t listen to how he breaks it down and how he talks about the power of, of God's word and God's principles, uh, that it's really going to help each one of us. Uh, and if we respond well, it's going to help us to avoid being derailed or delayed in God's plan for our lives as we step into 2024, being set up even better for all that God has for you for 2024. So I want you to turn your full attention, enjoy our online service today, and Happy New Year, and we will see you live next week. Horizon Fab, you guys ready to worship?
for the Lord God of mighty reigns. Hallelujah. Oh.
sing again. We fall down. And we fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet.
Come on, just the voices, let's sing out together. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. Is the Lamb. Is the Do what you need to. Come do what you want to in this place. Yes, you're deserving. Yes, you're worthy. Yes, you're worthy. Thank you for meeting with us today. Thank you for meeting with us today. Yes, we thank you for meeting with us in this place.
Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. Those he gathered from east and west and from north and south. Some have gone through desert wastelands, finding no way to a place where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty and their lives ebbed away. And then they cried out to the Lord in their troubles and he delivered them in their distress. We worship the one who's the deliverer. We worship the one who came to set us free. We worship the one who is working in your life. Every one of us, if you're a follower of Jesus, has a story of a God who redeemed you, who set, took you out of the miry clay and set your feet upon a rock. And to worship him I live. He is worthy of my worship. He is worthy of my praise. It's not something I have to do. It's something I get to do. Family, can I encourage you right now to just from that place of the story of God in your life, of his redeeming power, of his resurrection power, of his setting things right in your life. If you looked back at your life and you said, "With but God, thanks be to God, thanks be to God. And as you look forward, you look forward with hope because, but God, thanks be to God. Can I invite you, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is a biblical form of worship. It's not when you feel the vibe or anything like that. Worship, we lift our hands like the morning and the evening sacrifices. I see people lift their hands at hockey games. I see people lift their hands at football games, cheering on somebody with a puck or a ball. Is not Jesus worthy to worship you? To worship you, I live, John.
Uh, we're continuing a series called No Offense. Uh, and today we're going to be thinking about uh, a new topic, and uh, we're thinking about the idea of bitterness. Uh, last week we were thinking about, with Pastor Daniel, we were thinking about seeds, seeds. And today we want to think about roots. We were thinking about these agricultural pictures uh, that we often see in Scripture. Uh, and so we want to think about this idea of bitterness, thinking about roots, and seeing what God might want to do in us today as we follow him. Uh, I want to read two portions of scripture uh, this morning. One, a part of a story. One, a short verse that kind of will lay the foundation for where we're going to go. Uh, both of these stories uh, involve challenges, are in a context of difficulties. How many of us know that it can sometimes be difficult to follow Jesus? Anybody ever experienced that before? And most of us have. Sometimes there's a challenge. Sometimes there's struggle as we determine to follow him. And so we want to look at a couple story, well, one story, one scripture this morning, and then dive in as we think about bitterness. Uh, so I want to read uh, the beginning of a story of a character named Joseph, all the way back in the Old Testament, starting in Genesis chapter 37. Uh, before I mention Joseph, I just want to mention my wife, Astrid. Uh, you may notice that she's not here this morning. Uh, this morning, she was running an 8K in Vancouver, uh, and she ran her personal best time. So that's fantastic. Uh, one of the joys of being able to do church online is that if you miss it, which we encourage you to come in person, uh, but you can watch it afterwards. And so she'll be hearing uh, the message. She might be listening even now as she's on the sky trade coming home. Uh, but anyway, congratulations, Astrid. Well done. Back to Joseph. <laughs> so let's read the beginning of this story of Joseph as we dive in together. I'm going to start in verse 2, and it says, Joseph being 17 years old. Anybody 17 years old here this morning? Hey, there's some in the front row. Uh, 17 years old was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph bought a bad report to them, to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brother, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. What happens next in the story, Joseph, uh, probably not wisely, shares a couple dreams that God gave him, which causes his brothers to hate him even more. They're dreams that reveal favor upon his life. They reveal future events where God's going to use them and they would bow down to their very brother. And so we hear these stories of these brothers in conflict, anger and hatred in their hearts, but it goes further than that. And what they do when we read in verse 12, it says, now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said, are you not, not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said, here I am. So he said to him, go now and see if it is well with your brother, brothers with the flock and bring me word. So he goes to see how his brothers are doing, to check on them, a, a mission from his father. Then in verse 18, it says, they saw him from afar. They saw uh, Joseph from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him. So moments before, not moments, but days before, years before, there's this growing uh, jealousy and anger and hatred in their hearts. It says that they would speak harshly to him. And now we see what happens next. They see their brother coming and they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. They come up with this plan to throw him into a pit and leave him there. One of the brothers, Reuben, says, no, let's not kill him. Let's pretend like he did and let's sell him into slavery. What happens, some slave traders come along, they sell him into slavery, and the story kind of now keeps running. And we're going to come back to that idea before. 
But I want to do now is look to a scripture all the way in Hebrews. We started in Genesis. Let's look to Hebrews chapter 12. It's going to be on the TV behind us. And it says this, strive for peace with everyone and for, for with, uh, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. This morning we want to think about bitterness and how do we overcome it and how can we even avoid it in our lives. So let's pray as we dive into the word. God, we thank you for your living and active word. We're desperate for your word. We sang about it this morning. Your word that lives within, with, lives within us and transforms us, bringing us hope and life and aligning us with your ways, walking in your truth. So Holy Spirit, I pray that in these moments that we share, looking to your word, that you would speak to us. You would uh, highlight, you bring your holy flashlight to shine upon our hearts. And would you lead us into freedom? In Jesus' name, somebody said, amen. Uh, when I was at Bible school, uh, one thing that I had the opportunity to do during the summers, I was a landscaper. Uh, and so I really enjoyed Bible school. You'd be studying, writing papers, all that kind of stuff. A lot of your head and your heart. And then the summer would come around and I'd have the opportunity to be outside mowing lawns and building decks and taking care of gardens and trees. And there's a lot of things I liked about landscaping, especially if it involved gasoline. Uh, if there was a gas-powered mower, if there was some, an ATV I could drive on and pull things behind, I was a happy dude. Uh, power tools and saws, I love that part of the job. The part of the job I liked the least, other than getting yelled at by my boss, good morning, Rita, um, no, she didn't do that often. Um, but was I hated weeding. Does anybody here have a garden? A lot of us do. Actually, my wife and I, with some of our closest friends, we've just started a garden. And the thing I hate, before you can have a beautiful, flourishing garden that's full of life, maybe growing things, is you got to take care of the weeds. And it's a painstaking task. You are on your hands and knees, trying to find the weeds, getting them, rooting them out so that you can prepare the soil for something greater. Weeds are a problem in agriculture. They're a problem in your tomato patch. They're a problem in your beautifully pristine yard. Maybe there's some men or women here that they take the attention. They take pride in their beautiful green yard. Anybody like their nice lawn? Anybody? No, there's not many. Okay. But for those that do, you, the, the bane of your existence is weeds. Because weeds, they want to grow, they want to go deep, and they want to expand. They want to take over everything. And the same is true with bitterness. In Hebrews, it says to not let the root of bitterness spring up. The author is giving us a hint about how bitterness behaves in our hearts. It's like a weed. It's like a plant that wants to send its roots out to take things over and to snuff things out. Bitterness is like weeds in your garden. And if you have weeds in your garden, we know that we need to take them out. Bitterness is like a weed that spreads and chokes out life. It's an invasive species that wants to come and take over your very heart and bring destruction. So this morning, as we think about this text, this encouragement to not let it, see to it, be active, be attentive to not letting the root of bitterness spring up. We want to think about bitterness this morning from a few different angles. The first thing I want to think about when it comes to bitterness is what's the cause of bitterness? What causes bitterness in our lives? And we've been going through a series called No Offense. And there can be a lot of things that will cause bitterness to try to plant or embed in our hearts. 
Sometimes bitterness comes from when we are hurt by somebody else. And we take that to offense and we hold on to it. Sometimes, as we read in the story of Joseph and his brothers, bitterness can come from jealousy. Maybe you're jealous about what someone else has. Maybe you're jealous about their looks. You're jealous about their house. I don't know, but you're jealous about something and you take that jealousy and you allow it to embed in the soil of your heart. Maybe someone hasn't met your needs. Maybe growing up, it was your parents. You had a need for more affirmation. You had a need for whatever it is. And that unfulfilled need leads to a hurt that, again, you allow the seed to plant and grow in your heart. There's all sorts of reasons of what happens, things in life that come. There are pain, there are trials, there are disappointments, there's betrayal, there's deception. All of these things, they will happen and bitterness starts. The cause is when we let those things not only land on our hearts, but we allow them to grow in the soil of our hearts. We allow, we hold on to it. We let it remain. We don't address it. And then the bitterness starts to spread. There is an article uh, from Psychology Today that says all bitterness starts out as hurts. And your emotional pain may well relate to viewing whoever or whatever provoked this hurt as having malicious intent. As committing a grave injustice towards you as gratuitously wronging you and causing you grief. Anger and resentment, which are connected to bitterness, is what we're all likely to experience when we conclude that another has seriously abused us, left to fester, the righteous anger eventually becomes the corrosive ulcer that is bitterness. Bitterness is simply the hurts and hangups in life that we allow to remain, we hold on to, and we let fester in our lives. And it turns into bitterness. And maybe you've experienced bitterness in your life. What it's like to think about the hurt that someone caused you, the abuse that they did to you, Maybe you start losing sleep because all you can think about is what they did to you, how you've been wrong. Bitterness and unforgiveness are ultimately self-focused about how I've been grieved and wronged, how I've been disappointed. And so we think about it, we, we, we permeate on it, we meditate on it about this other person and what we wish that they got, that we wish that they had justice of how we're gonna get our revenge. Bitterness is about holding on to those things, jealousy and disappointments and anger. It's often things that we can't control. In life, many of the pains that you face aren't things in your control. They're outside of your control. Some of the roots of bitterness were caused when you were a child, but you've still been holding on to them, things that were beyond your control. I want to encourage us later this morning is that we do have control when it comes to allowing bitterness to grow or not grow in our lives. But there are real pains that are represented in this room and online here. I don't know all your stories, but I believe that pretty much all of us have some hurt, hang up, or potential bitterness that we've allowed to grow in your life. Whether it be from a family, friend, a spouse, a coworker, maybe your child, maybe the circumstances, maybe you're bitter at God, or maybe you're even bitter at yourself. And we've allowed it to grow, allowed it to spread in our garden. As I was preparing, I was thinking about coffee. Anybody big coffee drinker? Here, there's a few of us. I'm so grateful uh, for the coffee on Sunday mornings. It's so good. Uh, Also, this is a total random note. I just want to say thank you to all the volunteers that those in this room cannot see. I want to thank you to everyone up in the tech booth, up in NASA control. We say thank you. Those caring for kids and infants, we appreciate you so much, especially when they make things like this happen. Come on. They're the, we don't even see, anyway, you're doing an amazing job. We thank you so much. But uh, coffee is something that I've grown to like. Uh, I can remember when I was younger drinking coffee and thinking that my parents were totally crazy. Who in the world would drink this bitter brew? 
It's terrible. There's nothing good about this. And my parents would drink a few cups a day. Uh, and if my mom didn't drink it, her hands would shake. Hello, mom. She's right there. Anyway, I didn't understand it. And then I visited Sweden a few years ago and I started drinking coffee and something changed. I started to actually appreciate the taste and I started to like it. Well, I'm like, this is actually pretty good. And when I think about the bitterness in our hearts that I think some of us have actually acquired a taste for it. That we feel justified in our bitterness and we actually now view it as a bit of a badge of honor a bit of a virtue. It's amazing in our culture that it views bitterness, resentment, and anger as virtues, something to be celebrated. We're so familiar with bitterness that we've actually started to like the taste, if we're honest with ourselves. We see this in our culture. Uh, there was a reality TV show that I'm not recommending that you watch, but it's called Love is Blind. Um, and at the, the TV show is the silly premise that the two people can meet without seeing each other, but just by talking and fall in love. And then they get mar engaged and married and it's a debacle. It's reality TV show is chaos. That's not even reality. But what happens at the end, these people get married. They show the, sh they edit the show, time passes. And then a year later, they have the reunion show. And then the hosts come and say, hey, do you remember a year ago when that person hurt you? And their aim is to try to stir up this resentment and anger. One thing I enjoyed about watching the finale this year was that so many of them would say, that was a year ago. I released that a long time ago. But our culture is sitting there. We want the tea. We want the bitter tea. We want to hear the anger. We actually celebrate it with one another. Yeah, they should get it. They're so terrible. And we want to join in. We've gotten used to something that's poison. Bitterness is poison. Even when we feel justified that it's right that I hold on to this offense, it's actually something that's causing harm not only to you, but to the world around you. Life is never better when you are bitter. It's a problem. So we want to think about what is the trouble of bitterness. That's what it says in our Hebrews text. It says that no root of bitterness springs up. This is germinates or grows in your life and causes trouble. Here's the reality. We sometimes think that bitterness is benign, but that's not true. It's a malignant tumor that's going to bring trauma and trouble to your life. So what is the trouble that bitterness can cause? What can it do? What's interesting is this, is that that word trouble is actually kind of a word picture of being crowded out. Bitterness is like a root or is like a weed. Bitterness wants to get in your garden and then expand and crowd out the good plants. It wants to crowd out the love. It wants to crowd out the grace that you might experience in your life. It brings trouble because it starts robbing you of life and joy. The thing with the trouble of bitterness is that it grows in you. Bitterness grows in you when you don't address it. In the story that we read about Joseph and his brothers, we'll call them the bitter buddies, what happened is, is that they allowed jealousy and anger to grow. They were upset with the favored son. And now I'm a favored son, and so I know the ramification. Ask my mom, she's right there. But, <laughs> but they allowed this to grow, and it moved from jealousy into hatred in their hearts and minds. <laughs> Uh, but in their hearts and minds. <laughs> but then it keeps growing. It leads to their words. Now they start speaking negatively against Joseph. It's starting to permeate, starting to expand in their lives. Eventually it gets to the point where they throw their brother into a pit. What started out as a seed was planted and grew and moved from thoughts and intentions into words and then eventually into actions. And I'm not saying that your bitterness is going to cause you to throw someone into a pit, but I can guarantee that if you let bitterness grow, it will cause you to throw somebody under the bus. If you let bitterness grow, watch what happens to your mouth. 
Watch the way that you speak about your spouse. Watch the way this way you speak about your pastor. Watch the way that you speak about your boss. If you let bitterness grow, you will eventually, it will flow out in your words and potentially your actions. We need to address the trouble that is bitterness because it will grow in your life. It will grow in your life. And again, not only does it grow in you moving from these, the, the heart into your words, into actions, uh, it also affects your, your, your health. Bitterness poisons your health. It's part of the trouble of bitterness. It'll, it'll poison your emotional health as you stew on anger, as you stew on wrath as you stew on judgment. It'll affect your relational health as it destroys the relationships in your life of those that you're angry against, you're holding bitterness against. It will affect your spiritual health. Your vitality and grace will be sapped because of bitterness and it will even affect your physical health. Physical health is affected by you holding on to emotional bitterness. Studies will show that unresolved bitterness will affect your metabolism, produce anxiety, headaches, will decrease your immune response, will affect your organ functions, especially your heart. It's so funny, we often talk about bitterness growing in your heart. We're talking about your emotions, your mind, but bitterness also damages your physical heart when we hold on to something you were never meant to hold on to. And here's the thing, not only does it grow in you, it spreads beyond you. It spreads beyond you. In Hebrews, it tells us the no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it, many become defiled. If you don't deal, and if I don't deal, if we all don't deal with our bitterness, it will contaminate the culture, the community that you live in. That's what it does. The word defile can be translated contaminate. Have you ever thought about a dandelion before? You've seen these right now. They're probably going in your backyard. Anybody seen one of these that look like mini science worlds? Um, and I can remember as a kid, I loved ripping these and, and blowing them or ricking two of them and doing one of these. <laughs> so that all the seeds would fly everywhere. But this is what bitterness does. It starts as a root, eventually leads to a bitter fruit, which then expands and contaminates the world around you. Your bitterness isn't a you problem alone. Your unresolved bitterness is affecting the world around you. It spreads beyond you to others. You need to deal with your bitterness in your heart against your spouse because it's affecting your children. It's affecting the environment of your home. You need to deal with the bitterness against your boss because guess what? Your workplace is contaminated and watch out what's happening there. And we need to know this, that the context of the author of Hebrews, he's writing to the church. A church that knew difficulty, challenge, divisions, even this text, this idea of the root of bitterness comes all the way from Deuteronomy. Again, in a time where there was difficulties and divisions in Israel, God's people, some people were turning away from God and there was disagreements. The reality is this, is that bitterness can and does affect communities of faith. We need to address it so it doesn't contaminate our church. That Horizon Church, our church needs us as individuals to resolve our bitterness lest we affect the fruitfulness of this ministry because we can contaminate the soil, we can contaminate others around us as our bitterness grows beyond us. That's the trouble of bitterness. It grows not only in you, but it also spreads beyond you, bringing trouble and difficulty and strife beyond where you are. So what I wanna think about now is what do we do? <laughs> if you'd say, and maybe here, we were praying earlier, Holy Spirit, see if there's any unforgiveness. Maybe the Holy Spirit highlighted something for you. Maybe as I've been speaking about holding on to hurts, the Holy Spirit has been highlighting something to you. In preparation for this message, trust me, the Holy Spirit put his finger on my heart and said, what about this? How do we remove bitterness? How do we deal with these roots 
these weeds that have entangled us, that have grown and are basically chains for our hearts and souls. What do we do with bitterness? How do we remove them? The first thing we need to do is we got to get aggressive. Someone say, be aggressive. No, we won't do that. Cheer. But you, <laughs> but you got to get aggressive. If you are passive, you will not deal with bitterness. That's what we've been doing for years and it didn't work. If you want to deal with bitterness, you got to get at it. You got to get aggressive. That's why it says strive for peace. It says see to it. These are action words. These are go get it. Find the bitterness and deal with it. You got to get aggressive. You got to take the first step in dealing with the bitterness in your hearts. We see that in our story of Joseph. If we had more time, we would read more of the story. But Joseph is sold into slavery, becomes a slave in a home, is falsely accused, then ends up in prison. Uh, from prison, he's forgotten, ends up second in command of Egypt. It's a fantastic story. Read it. But what's incredible is that years later, when a famine has come, that Joseph's family, he sees them again. And what we can read in Genesis 45 is that Joseph takes the initiative. When it comes to forgiving, comes to releasing his brothers from what they've done to him, he doesn't wait for them to apologize, that he gets aggressive. He doesn't want it to grow, so he goes for it. And he says in uh, Genesis 45, verse 4, So Joseph said to his brother, Come near to me, please. He's initiating. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. He takes the first step. We got to get aggressive. We got to seek it out. If you've got bitterness, don't let it grow. We need to get at it. And here's the thing with bitterness. What grows in the dark will die in the light. What grows in the dark will die in the light. Have you ever noticed that the roots of weeds grow in dark soil? And so one of the things I can remember doing landscaping is that sometimes you got to dig to find where those roots have gone. You get the little shovel, you get the little claw thing, and you, you till the soil and you figure out where are the roots so you can actually pull them out. You got to get light on it. You got to see it. As it says in Ephesians 5, verse 11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. The way we deal with our bitterness is we actually expose it. We think about it. We talk about it. We pursue it. We see what's going on in our hearts. Because the reality is, is sometimes we've got so used to the bitterness that we didn't even know it was there. And so we got to search it out sometimes. we got to find those roots. But here's the good news. Uh, it's good and bad news. You cannot deal with bitterness by yourself. You can't do it. You can't find and cut the roots out by yourself. But this morning we sang about our desperation for a God who's our very breath, our source, our supply. We know someone that can actually help us effectively and forever deal with the bitterness in our hearts. So we need to learn to partner with the Holy Spirit and use the pruning shears of the word. It says this in Psalm 139, one of my favorite Psalms in verse 23, search my heart, O God, what a dangerous prayer if you want to live a comfortable life. <laughs> if you want to keep walking in bitterness, don't pray that prayer. But if you want to be free of bitterness, pray that prayer. God, would you search my heart? We've got blind spots we often can't see, but we know a God who knows every intimate detail of our hearts. And we can ask him, God, would you come and search my heart? Would you see if there be, try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way Bitterness is grievous. And lead me into the way everlasting. The path to everlasting life and to freedom is first allowing the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. It also says this, we, so we need to let the Holy Spirit search our hearts, but then we need the pruning shears of the word. Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions 
of the heart. If I've got bitter intentions, I need to let the word, God's living and active word, I need to read it, but I need to let it read me and expose and reveal the bitterness in my own heart and then apply the power of the word to then chop those roots. It's his word that's living and active. I can't do it on my own. You can't do it on your own, but you're not alone. We've got the Holy Spirit. We've got the power of the word to pull those weeds out of our lives. How else do we remove? How else do we get rid of these roots of bitterness that sometimes we allow grow in our lives? It says in the text in Hebrews, in verse 15, it says, uh, see to that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. One of the solutions to getting rid of bitterness is by functioning and acting in the opposite spirit. Bitterness says, I'm going to hold on to the offense. Bitterness says, I'm going to hold on to judgment. I'm going to hold on to anger. But grace is about giving. Grace is the opposite, is about releasing. We, if we want to overcome bitterness, we actually need to function in the opposite spirit and be those who give. Uh, it says, when you think about forgiveness, it says in Ephesians 4, 31, Pastor Craig mentioned this morning, let all bitterness, all of it, sometimes we think I'll get rid of this bitterness, but not this bitterness. I'm holding on to that one as we choose to drink poison to hurt somebody else. Not only are we hurt, but our community is hurt as well. But it says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another. Now we're thinking about the giving. Tender hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. One of the ways that we get rid of bitterness is not hold on, but release and give. We release people of the debt they owe against us and we release them to God. We say that I can't do this. Vengeance isn't mine. I'm going to trust the Lord with this and I'm going to release them from it. It's forgiveness. And we can forgive because we've already been forgiven. For those of us who've been forgiven in Christ by the blood of the Lamb, we are now empowered and enabled to extend forgiveness to other people. Just as Christ has forgiven us, we forgive, release, and extend grace to others. One other thing that we can do is, is we can actually, again, operating in the opposite spirit, uh, bitterness says, I, I'm going to talk bad. Bitterness wants to, to throw people down, to get angry. But the opposite spirit is that we would speak blessing. One thing I love about the story of Joseph is that Joseph speaks blessing over his brothers. At the end, he could have said, you were the guys that threw me into a pit. Now I'm going to throw you into a pit because I'm second in command. Could he have done it? 100% he could have done it. But instead, he spoke blessing. And not only spoke a blessing, but he, he gave a blessing. He provided them with land to live and provision and food. If we want to overcome bitterness, we need to operate in the opposite spirit and be those who give and extend grace and blessing to others. And that helps defeat those roots in our lives. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When it comes to bitterness and forgiveness, it's not an easy process. Just because I'm speaking for 30 minutes doesn't mean for a second that I believe that you can, it's you know, a quick, easy process. It's not often. And that's why often we need help in the journey to invite people in, friends, pastors, counselors. I'm looking forward to in a few weeks, Pastor Shannon is going to be preaching on forgiveness. And so we'll get to go deeper into that. What does it mean and what does it look like to forgive others? Last thought before we close. As we're thinking about bitterness, we've thought about the cause of bitterness. We've thought about, thought about the trouble it causes, thought about its removal. But I don't want to just leave you with removal. How do we discover and unroot bitterness by giving grace and extending forgiveness? But actually, I would really want us to all learn how to avoid letting bitterness even take root in our lives. Because guess what? You can actually avoid bitterness. And so let's think about that for a second. Um, again, have you ever, you know, we're getting into summertime and you're going to see people, they're spending time feeding their lawns, watering their, you know, their lawns in the front of their house. And those that do it well have these beautiful, thick, green yards. Have you seen one of those before? 
Maybe it's at your house, not at mine. I live in a condo. But they have these beautiful, beautiful lawns. And what happens is, is those beautiful lawns that are thick and luscious with great roots, they actually become resistant to, to, to weeds being, to growing in those very gardens. Because here's the thing. Weeds want to crowd out healthy things, love and joy and grace. But the opposite is true. When we fill our garden with love and joy and grace, it actually can crowd out the roots of bitterness so that when hurt comes, offense comes, we can deal with it healthily and not hold on to it and let it develop roots. We need a healthy garden. When we look at the story of Joseph, he's like Teflon to bitterness. He is thrown into a pit, uh, put a, a slave and falsely accused, thrown into the prison and forgotten. But we get this sense that he never gets bitter. He's not perfect. But we do get the sense that he's not bitter. How does he do it? A few things we can look at his life when it comes to how do we have a well-watered lawn that's resistant to, yard, to, resistant to weeds is that as we walk closely with God again and again and again in his story, we read that God was with him. We read that the Holy Spirit was upon him. We get the sense that he's humble, that he's someone that's serving the Lord. Markers of those with a close walk with Jesus is that he discovers that in his life-giving, healthy relationship with God, that even though the pain comes, trouble comes, he's able to not let it embed in his heart, into his garden and grow, that we can do the same thing. That as we choose to allow the spirit to produce the fruit of love and joy and peace and patience that becomes more and more difficult for unforgiveness, anger, wrath, jealousy to take root because we've filled our garden with such great things that God has for us, that we can be like Joseph. And even though the challenges may come, but we can actually become a blessing. Again, Joseph lived and functioned in the opposite spirit. For those that encaptured him, he blessed them. For those that were his slaveholders, those that were his prison guards, he blessed them to the point that they gave him the keys. He didn't then plan revenge and escape route. No, he just said, I'm going to bless them even more. They can trust me. And he avoids the bitterness that took out his brothers that harmed them. He doesn't speak terrible. He actually seeks to bless. We need to live in the opposite spirit. The Bible says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I believe that the spirit is here. I believe that we're a spirit-empowered people, that the spirit has come to indwell in us. And if the spirit is residing in you, there is freedom from bitterness. That is, he produces the life flourishing life in him, well-watered lives, well-watered gardens, that we can actually be free from the chains of bitterness, the chains and the weeds and the roots that would seek to choke out life and hope and joy, that as we live and walk in this spirit, that we can actually live free from those burdens and then be those that help bring freedom to others. Because where the spirit is, there is freedom. Freedom from bitterness as we walk through forgiveness. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this morning. And God, we thank you so much that you have forgiven us. That you, through your blood, didn't count against us our sin. You don't count it anymore, but you've released us. And God, would we be those who would release those who have hurt us? Lord God, those that were jealous against, those who have lied about us, those who have slandered us, those who have abused us. God, that you would help us to do what feels impossible, and that's to forgive. But we know it's possible because you enable us. Your grace empowers us to forgive. That as we, it flows in us, it can extend beyond us. We thank you, God that it's your desire that we live free, that we live in a healthy garden with flourishing relationships, not contaminated by bitterness, but blessed by your love, by blessed by your grace that's growing and vibrant. And so God, I pray right now for those who are experiencing and you're highlighting in their hearts the pains of the past, areas where they have bitterness. God, I pray that they would feel the hope that is to know that through forgiveness, they can find 
freedom. God, I pray that through the hard work of exposing and digging up roots, God, that they would know that you're with them, enabling and empowering them to be free from that which has been poisoning them, in some cases, for years. And God, would we be serious about the roots of bitterness, getting rid of them, not only for our sake, but for our children, for our coworkers, for our families, our marriages, our household, our church, and even our nation. And God, that we would actually function in the opposite and see an expansion of your grace and love from our yard to the next yard to the next yard until the whole nation knows the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God, we thank you for freedom. We thank you uh, for the life that's found in you alone. In Jesus' name, somebody said, amen. Amen.